going to start with P1, and this is solving equations. Again, nothing in chapter P is brand new, okay? So hopefully this is easy stuff, but we still make silly mistakes along the way. We have not done rational equations this year. You did do rational equations in Algebra 1, and you did do algebra equ um, rational equations in Algebra 2. But as a refresher, so if there's a fraction in your equation, we have done those. Like one way to deal with these is to eliminate the denominator by multiplying by the least common multiple, okay? And then ones that have variables in the bottom, so that's what this part means. Anything that's got a variable in the denominator, you have to check for an extraneous root. So once you solve, you have to check to make sure. You don't have to plug it all the way back in, but you have to see if when you were to plug it into the denominator, if it would give you zero in the denominator, which would make it undefined. So that's what you're checking for there. All right, so the beginning, like if I look at just A, what would we multiply everything by? 24, right? That The least common multiple of 8 and 3. So then we'd multiply each fraction by 24 and the last term that's all the way on the other side of the equal sign. So 8 goes into 24 three times. And then 3 times 3x would be 9x minus 3 goes into 24 8 times. 8 times 4x would be 32x. And then 4 times 24 is 96. Combine your like terms. So this would be negative 23x equals 96. Divide both sides by negative 23. And this goes 3 times. No. So then, because there's no variable in the denominator here, I don't have to worry about checking it or for extraneous roots because there's no way for it to be undefined. Easy stuff, right? We remember these kinds of questions. Yeah, okay. All right, so for A, before I can figure out what to multiply by, I have to factor each of the denominators. So the first one is already, obviously, as factors in simplest form, second one, same thing. The third one, how would I factor x squared plus 3x? Take an x out. Take an x out, and I get x times x plus 3. Then I have to figure out what my least common denominator is, and this is going to be the least common multiple of my denominators. So for every term that's there, I would use it. If it's raised to a power, I would take it to the highest power. So for this example, what's my least common denominator? x and x plus 3. So I multiply all three fractions by x and then x plus 3. So from the first one, my x cancels, and I end up with 6 times x plus 3. There's a minus here, and it's one of the most common mistakes people make, so be careful with that minus. From the second one, the x plus 3s cancel, and I get minus 2x equals, I can cancel out my x's and my x plus 3's, and I get 3 times x plus 5. So I get 6x plus 18 minus 2x equals 3x plus 15. I get 4x plus 18 equals 3x plus 15. Subtract the 3x, x plus 18, God bless you, equals 15, subtract the 18, and x equals negative 3. So then because there is a fraction with a variable in its denominator in my original question, I have to check these answers. And you could do this two ways. I could literally take that negative 3 and I could plug it into these variables, seeing which one would, if it would give me a 0 in the denominator. Or from the beginning, you can establish your domain restrictions by saying, what's going to make each of these denominators zero, which would be that x cannot equal zero, so it's not a problem that we got a negative three. But this one, x could not equal negative three because if I plug in that negative three, I get zero in that denominator. So because it doesn't work in that one, we rule it out. It's called an extraneous root, and there would be no solution here. So even if it works in one denominator but not in the other, it's no solution. If there were two answers, so someone should factor these, if there were two answers, one worked, one didn't, I would keep whatever, does, whatever works, and I would get rid of whatever doesn't work. Questions on those? Okay. 
This we have done a million times this year and yet people are still making mistakes on it. So we're gonna drill it in one last time. The even root property. The even root property tells you that when you have an X raised to an even root equals something and then you go to take that even root, so a square root for example, you have to put plus and minus in front of your square root. There are two answers there. So something for like A, I'm going to first divide by nine and I would get X squared equals four and then I would square root both sides, putting a plus and minus in front of the four. And I get X equals plus and minus the square root of four or plus and minus two. For B, you would first add the 27. Then you would square root both sides, putting a plus and minus in front of the square root of the 27. Twenty-seven is not a perfect square, but if you were to break it down into its factor tree, it's three and nine, which is three and three. So two threes come to the outside of your square root, and the one three is left underneath. Two x plus three. Now I want to isolate the x, so I can subtract three. You can either put that at the front or the back of that statement. So it could be negative three plus and minus three root three and then divide by two. So this answer can be written just as it is. If this was multiple choice, it would be separated out into two like that. So you, if it's just open-ended, like your homework is just open-ended, you are also done with web assign. It is just open-ended. You can just enter that in as this. this. Questions on even root. All right, then comes complete the square. We have done this so many times this year that this should be second nature at this point. This last round, we, we I went a little bit easier so you didn't have like the coefficients and that kind of stuff. But this goes back to quadratic, so this is like chapter two. So I'm gonna solve this by completing the square. My first step is to group the first terms together, the x squared and the x go together, and the other number goes to the other side of the equal sign. Or that number stays on the same side, because it doesn't matter, but you have to make sure that you balance out your equation. So I think it's easier to bump it to the other side so that I add, from the, I add to the left and I add to the right. Next step would be to take out the four. So I take the four out and I have to take that off of the x squared and also the negative five x. When we did these with quadratics, like if you remember we did these with parabolas, I'm going back a long time, but if we did the, when we did these with parabolas in chapter two, we kept everything on one side, okay? You don't have to do that when you're solving. So I could actually from here take and divide both sides by four if I wanted to. And then I don't have to worry about multiplying what's on the front of the parentheses before adding it to the other side. So I'm gonna show you both ways. One is the way that we did it when we kept it in standard form, which is I'm gonna keep it the way that it is. And then I would take my 5 fourths, divide it by two or multiply by a half, and that's 5 eighths, square it, and it's 25 60 fourths. And I add it here. And then normally I add it to the other side of the equal sign, but before I do that, I have to multiply by the four that I took out. Four goes into 64 16 times. So this is nine plus 25 over 16. In order to combine those, I have to give nine 16 as a denominator. So I do 16 times nine. So I get 144 over 16 plus 25 over 16, and I get 169 over 16. Four is still on the front of my parentheses. And then to factor our perfect square we made, we square root the first term, we square root the last term, we take the sign from the middle, put it in parentheses and square it.
Now I gotta solve this, so we're back to basically where we were on the last slide, because here's my even root stuff. I would divide both sides by four or multiply by a fourth. I get x minus 5 eighths squared equals 169 over 64. I square root both sides of the equation. I get x minus 5 eighths equals plus and minus the square root of 169, which is 13, over the square root of 64, which is 8. And then I add the 5 eighths, and there's two answers here, 5 eighths minus 13 eighths and 5 eighths plus 13 eighths. So I get negative 8 over 8, which is negative 1, and, and positive 18 over 8, which is 9 fourths. And those are your two answers. So now if you had, because you can do these differently because we're not putting them in a quadratic form. If at this point, x squared minus 5 fourths x. If at this point, you wanted to divide both sides by 4, I'd get x squared minus 5 fourths x equals 9 fourths. Now I want to complete this space. So I would take my 5 fourths, divide it by 2, that's 5 eighths, square it. That's 6, 25 64 I'd add it here, and I'd add it over here without having to multiply it by 4. So that's the difference. If you divide both sides by the leading coefficient, then you don't have to then multiply it before you add it to the other side because there's nothing out on the outside. Then I would factor this, so 5 eighths squared equals, I'd still have to multiply by 16. So I'd still get the 144 plus 25. I'd still end up with 169 over 64. So it's a different, you do it at a different time, but your answer ends up being the same at the end. So you get to have, you get to choose that. When we do it with quadratics, we wanted to keep it in quadratic form. We wanted to keep it in f of x form because it was a function. So it was different. But now you're solving these. So you can totally do them either way. Questions? All right, quadratic formula. So this is your fallback if you cannot factor, if you cannot complete the square, if you cannot do any other way, you use the quadratic formula. This can be done on anything that's got an x squared on it. In order to do this, I wanna get everything to one side so it's set equal to zero, and then identify your a, your b, your c. Because you're moving these and the x squared is negative, I would probably move them the other way. It doesn't mean you can't go any other way, but I would probably move them the other way. So zero would equal 49x squared minus 28x plus four. And then you identify your a, your b, your c, and you plug it into your quadratic formula. So your a is 49, your b is negative 28, and your c is four. So I get x equals negative negative 28, which means this is a positive 28, plus and minus the square root of negative 28 squared minus 4 times 49 times c over 2 times 49. So x equals 28 plus and minus the square root of 28 squared is 784. So if I gave you a calculator, obviously numbers can be big. If I didn't, they probably wouldn't be this big. And then 4 times 9 times 4, okay, 16 times 49 is what it would have been, which is also 784 over 98. So I get 28 plus and minus squared is 0, which is 0 over 98, which means my two answers are 28 over 98. Or not two answers. There's only one answer because it's plus and minus 0. And then you want to reduce from here. So 7 goes into both of these. This would be 4 and 14 and then 2 sevenths. Oh. Questions on that one?
All right. Factoring and then solving. Also something we've done a million times this year. Okay. So you're, you in this section could have a ton of different kinds of factoring. You'd have to be able to, if it was just a trinomial, if it's complete this, if it's a um, perfect square trinomial, if it's four terms to a factor by grouping, if it's um, different to two squares, like all of that can get looped in together. So if you see something like A, what are you going to do? Good. Take out an x squared, x minus 3. Take out a negative 1, x minus 3. And then what's inside the parentheses matches. And then I group together what's left. Have I factored completely? This would be x plus 1, x minus 1, because it's a different two squares. And then you split and solve. So each parentheses gets set equal to 0, and I end up with 3, negative 1, and positive 1. x to the fourth plus 7x squared minus 8. Factor that. This time, it's like you're, you know, it's just a trinomial, but the first term is x squared instead of x to the first. Factors of negative 8 that sum to 7 would be what? Good. Positive 8, negative 1. You can either try to factor this another step, or you could split and solve it, but use your even root property. You'd still get the same answer. So this does not factor because it's positive, but this would factor into x plus 1, x minus 1. And then if I split and solve, this is x squared equals negative 8. When you go to square root, you get plus and minus the square root of negative 8. So if this was an all solutions answer, this is where your i would come into play, right? This would be i root plus and minus i root 8. 8 is 2 and 4, 2 and 2, so this would be plus and minus 2i root 8. Then I would get x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. So if the instructions say find all solutions, then I would get negative 1, positive 1, and plus and minus 2i, not root 8, 2i root 2. If it said find all the real number solutions, I would not keep the i, I would only keep the positive and negative one. All right, radical equations are next. So these are your square root equations, right? These, I don't know if we did these this year. I know we did these in algebra two, but I don't know if, I don't think we've done these. I mean, obviously we've done parts of these, but not all the way through. So if you're dealing with a radical equation, if there's a square root, if there's a cube root, if any kind of root in your equation, then you want to isolate that square root first. Then you want to square or cube both sides of the equation. Anything with an even root, you have to check your answers. So if there's a square root in your original equation, you want to make sure you check for extraneous roots. Okay. If there's a fourth root, you want to check. The odd roots won't matter because you can odd root a positive or negative, so it doesn't matter. But the even roots, you want to check. So if I'm looking at A, the first thing I'm going to do is move the 3 to the other side. So you want to isolate the radical. Then I would square both sides of the equation to get rid of the radical. And I get 5 minus x equals 9. Subtract the 5. Negative x equals 4. Multiply or divide by negative 1. And x equals negative 4. Check making sure that when you plug it back in, you're not square rooting a negative number. That's basically what it means. So if I plug that back in, I get 5 minus a negative 4 or 5 plus 4, which is 9, and that can be done, okay? You're not checking to see if you're right. You're checking for an extraneous root. For B, you've got a cube root. So the first thing I'm going to do is, again, isolate the cube root, so I subtract the 2. I cube both sides of the equation. I'd end up with 4x minus 3 equals what's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. Negative 8. Add the 3. 4x equals negative 5. Divide by 4. And x equals negative 5 fourths. So because it had an odd root, you don't need to check it. 
You can check it, of course, to get see if your answer's right, but you don't need to check it because it's got an odd root at the beginning. All right, then you get to see. So these are your fractional ex exponents. They don't look like they're square roots, right? But if I have a fractional exponent, three halves really means I take the square root of that and then I cube it. So it is a fractional equation. You don't have to do that step because in order to get rid of the three halves, I wanna make that one. I raise these to the reciprocal. So what's the reciprocal of three halves? Two thirds. Two -thirds. So then I get x plus 3 equals, because these would cancel to give you 1. This is the cube root of 8 squared. The cube root of 8 is what? 2. 2, two squared is? 4. four and subtract the 3, and x is 1. Now, because the denominator on this original thing was a 2, that means it's a square root. I have to check these. So if I plug in a one, does this stay positive is what I'm looking for, and it does, so I know I can keep that answer. We still good? Yes? All right, last slide is your absolute value equations. So if you've got absolute value in your equation, the first thing you have to do is isolate the absolute value. So if this 12 was like, if it's an absolute value of 13 plus one, minus 12 equals zero. First thing you're gonna do is isolate the absolute value. So you'd move the 12 to the other side. And then you remove absolute value by setting whatever's inside that absolute value equal to the positive and negative version of that number. So I can say 13x plus one equals negative 12 and 13x plus one equals positive 12. The reason for that is because if inside here is 12, the absolute value is going to stay 12. But if inside there is also negative 12, it would become positive 12. The absolute value would make it positive. What I have seen with absolute values that are weird, like people will take and change the sign that's inside. Like if it's negative, they will make it positive. You can't change what's inside the absolute value. You're changing what it's equal to. So I set it equal to positive and negative 12. I'd get 13x equals, this is minus 13 divide both sides by 13, and x is negative 1. Subtract the 1, 13x equals 11, divide both sides by 13, and x equals 11 over 13. And there are your two answers for your absolute value. No, you don't have to check absolute value. You can. The only time you have to check absolute value, I think it's like if there's a squared inside the absolute value, but you won't see that. What you could see with absolute value too, that's like um, a special case, is like if it's negative 12, right? If you have an absolute value equal to negative number, can that ever happen? No, and this would be a no solution problem. If it was absolute value equals zero, then obviously there's no such thing as plus or minus zero. You just remove the absolute value bars and solve it. So if it's a positive, you set it equal to positive negative version of that number. If it's negative, there's no solution. And if it's zero, there's only one solution. Any questions overall on any of the solving of the equations? Again, hopefully this is review, but some, some of those things we haven't done in a while, so, and it's so important. Okay, so you have two choices for the rest of your time. One is to, you can start this assignment, but you're also, so if you're not gonna be here tomorrow, maybe, and you're done with your project, I would do the assignment. But if you are going to be here tomorrow, you will get to work on this assignment in class tomorrow, okay? And I would say focus on your project. So if you want to ask questions about your project, if you want to make sure you like go, my advice is to go through on the very bottom of the PDF, it says this is what needs to get turned in in this order. Make sure that's all there. And then check your rubric. Make sure that anything that's on that rubric, nothing surprises you, okay? Try to be as transparent as possible with this. I feel like if you get points off on your project, you really did not pay attention, okay? It is not, there's nothing tricky about it. All right.